How's it? Your good buddy Sheets from the ABCA. We're actually broadcasting live from Cedar Rapids, Iowa at the Division Three Baseball Championships. And uh, what a fantastic opportunity this is to be here. But with this Extra Innings episode, we wanted to go into another topic and realm that we hadn't done before. We've done Extra Innings with Brian Green, Mexico State, talking hitting. Hopefully you've watched that one. Also, Ryan Cianco, the catching coordinator for the LA Dodgers, obviously talking catching, but it's the fact that they're sharing their screens to take you through all the details inside how they teach those fundamentals of the game. Well, with this episode, we're right back in that same space. We're gonna connect with Trent Mongero, loyal ABCA member, but a guy that's done fantastic things on the high school level, and what he'll bring to you revolves around catch play. Now, the interesting thing about Trent is uh, he turned North Hall High School there in Georgia into a perennial powerhouse, winning the state championship in his last year, getting voted as the 2017 National High School Coach of the Year before he took the opportunity to go be the head coach at Glenn Academy in Georgia. So he's there at Glenn trying to build a program on all the things that he holds true in the game. But one thing that's been consistent has been his catch play routine that he feels like across all fundamentals, all positions, it really shows up when it matters. He calls it the most important 20 minutes at practice, and we're going to follow Trent along as he shares the screen, takes us through all the details inside that, but we get so much more. We get to hear from Trent, how he arrived at this mentality in terms of how he approaches the development of his club, and certainly what he holds true out there on the baseball field. So we hope you enjoyed this episode of Extra Innings. We appreciate you going in for some free baseball with us. Let us know how we can help, and again, enjoy the episode. All right, Trent, thanks for jumping on with us, my man. Hey, glad to be here, Sheets. Man, I'm excited for this one. We're going to break down catch play, which, as most of our listeners and viewers know, man, is just an absolute sweet spot for me. I love talking it through, and I think we've got one of the very best in our game, in our community, on the line with us. But let's go ahead and kick this off, Trent. Take our listeners through your ABCA experience, where you come from inside the association. You've been speaking at Barnstormers. You got to jump on the main stage a couple years ago, got recognized as our National Assistant Coach of the Year. Just open up the ABCA and what's meant to you throughout your coaching career. Man, the ABCA is unbelievable, Sheets. I mean, what an organization. I've had a chance to grow as a coach by learning from so many of the top coaches, going out to the national convention every year and being around the top minds and just, you know, socializing, talking baseball, and not even on the, uh, you know, not even being in the big arena. Sometimes just right. being in a back room somewhere, up in your room in the hotel getting a couple coaches together, talking the game, um, being around thousands and thousands of brotherhood, just like yourself. Yeah. Uh, doesn't get much better than that. That's awesome. Do you find yourself at a convention uh, with a game plan? I always want, I'm interested when coaches, they show up on site, and certainly you're going to go watch clinics and you're going to walk the trade show. But right. do you find yourself with like a game plan of, hey, man, I, I want to get better in these certain areas, so I'm going to seek out these you know, real specific conversations. Do you have that at all? Absolutely. I, I look at the convention ahead of time and I kind of pick out the key people I want to listen to. Okay. Um, I always go to the infield guys because that's my greatest passion. But mm -hmm. I also, as a head coach at the high school level, have to know the game uh, from from top to bottom. So I try to cover the gamut of topics that are that are offered by the ABCA. But I yeah. also spend a lot of time down, you know, with the vendors um, making, you know, it's amazing that the conversations that have taken place there. In fact, some of the greatest things I've learned is just bumping into new people down there yeah. and sharing ideas. Um, so sometimes I just, you know, I have the greatest intentions to be somewhere and then, you know, you sure. get talking to somebody and the next thing you know, you miss a, you know, you miss a talk and it's like, but you do, you can always go back and watch the videos. That's the great thing about you guys recording those things. So, um, for anybody that hasn't been, it's a no-brainer for a baseball coach. I mean, it really is. It is yeah. a no-brainer. I look forward to it every year. Well, we certainly appreciate that as we're gearing up here to actually head to Nashville for our site visit, Trent, and try to get our ducks in a row before we have uh, about 7,000 coaches show up January 2nd through the 5th in Nashville. We're going to make sure we're prepared for that. Um, but I think as a starting place for this conversation, man, I'd like for you to take our viewers through your career path in baseball. I think open up your playing career into obviously playing pro ball for a little bit, then moving into coaching and certainly the transition across a lot of different levels. Open up that conversation for us. Well, you know, baseball has been my life. Um, I knew as a player that I wanted to be a coach. I made mm -hmm. a promise to myself when I was in, in high school, in fact, that when my playing days came to an end, that I would be a high school baseball coach. And wow. I, I really kind of forgot about that as I pursued my college career. Had a lot of adversity, overcame adversity, 
Um, you know, went to a four year school to start off with and transferred to junior college and being a commitment guy, you know, that may sound a little bit funny to some people, especially those that follow me as much as I preach commitment, but I did go four to two to four yeah. and, uh, had an amazing junior college experience and, uh, then went to UNC Wilmington and, uh, wouldn't trade it for the world. Uh, really learned, you know, the majority of what I share as a coach, I learned at UNCW. Mark Scaff is the head coach there. It just, just, uh, retiring this year and he was my infield guy and uh, anyways when I got done with with UNC Wilmington I had a short stint in pro ball amazing experience wouldn't trade it for the world a bunch of the guys around me got to play in the bigs and uh, you know I got a chance to pursue my dream like you want a chance right that's sure. all we really want yeah. and uh, got that chance so uh, when I was released did some soul searching and it hit me I was walking the beach in Wilmington North Carolina and it like hit me like you made a promise to yourself and uh so 27 years ago, that was I, I, you know, literally went right back to school to get my degree to be a physical education teacher. And um, here I am. So, you know, it, it's been quite a journey. Wouldn't trade it for the world. Um, Coach, you know, hundreds upon hundreds of players. And, um, you know, it's a great calling. Absolutely love it. I want to go into this because uh, this is always an area for me that I think is so critical because we will have older coaches. They offer perspective, they offer experience, and they're watching this and, and they get it. But I'm also thinking about the younger coach, the 22, 23, 24, 25, 30 year old coach mm. that's watching this. And so, for a guy to have the experience and the perspective that you have, Trent, when you mm. look back, who were you as a young coach? Who <laughs> was that dude? And then, as you've progressed, what are maybe the lessons that you've learned that bring you to right now? Um, great question. Uh, I was a fireball is what I was. I uh, can certainly you know. pin you on that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought I was still playing uh, when I was coaching. Um, yeah. But uh, I really didn't understand some of the finer points to coaching. I, I really lived and died sheets with every single play. No doubt. I would argue with umpires, you know, at the drop of a hat. Um, just felt like every little thing was the biggest thing. Mm -hmm. And over time you know, through advice of other coaches and going to the ABCA. And I think Ray Tanner probably had the, the most impact on me with that because he shared a story with me, how he was at NC State versus how he made the change at South Carolina wow. after, you know, some years in that he started not to, to, you know, live and die with everything himself and maybe relax, maybe relax yeah. a little bit. And, yeah. and I started applying that and basically, um, it worked. It really worked. Your players feed off of you. Mm -hmm. So any young coach out there, I would say, you know, just try to be even keel. You got to pick and choose your times to argue. You know, I'm probably on a field to argue a call three times a year now, maybe. Mm. Um, and I got to know that I'm right, that I'm very tactful. Try to be anyways with how I <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> handle those umpires. But I've changed. I've changed a lot in the way that I coach, uh, the way that I communicate. Um, the way I handle my players and certainly just my overall demeanor uh, during the game. Now, when we first met, you were at North Hall and certainly mm -hmm. had a great run there at North Hall High School. And then moving now to Glen Academy, which is such mm -hmm. a unique opportunity and setting there in Georgia. Can you just open up what's going on there with the academy? But then also, what are you now building this program upon? What are maybe the staples or pillars in place that, that you think are going to build Glenn into a, a contender for state championships? Well, first of all, a lot of people hear Glenn Academy and they think private school. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a public school. We're literally the second oldest high school in the state of Georgia and the fifth oldest high school in the United States of America. How about that? So yeah, a little bit of history there. Sure. So, um, you know, this program has a ton of potential. And when I was at North Hall, we won the state in 2017. Mm -hmm. I wasn't looking to leave. Uh, got a call from Glen Academy down here. We're almost in Florida. We're like 30 miles mm -hmm. from, from Jacksonville on the coast. You know, beautiful place. St. Simon's Island is here, Jekyll Island, and the city of Brunswick. Uh, they built a multi-million dollar baseball complex. Adam Wainwright of the St. Louis Cardinals was directly involved and you know i saw the potential um you know the the school had done well but to this point you know they really haven't made any deep runs into the state playoffs in over 20 years and uh just felt like it was going to be a, a challenge that i would enjoy really my last building project is the way i saw it i'm 52 years old 
And um, it's, it's really has been a challenge. It, it certainly has been a challenge. But just building the foundations, the routines, uh, the expectations, mm -hmm. uh, holding people accountable. You know, it reminds me a lot, Sheets, of my first few years uh, at North Hall. Okay. And um, yeah, really just, you know, just building is not easy and, and you have to be patient. And, you know, so there's there's been some struggles, but those are expected and uh, we will get through them for sure. OK, so do I, look, do I look all right? Yeah, it's perfect, dude. This staring is staring at that Franken thing. I know. Doesn't it make you go cross eyed? <laughs> I just feel you. like I feel like it looks dumb. Like I keep wanting to look down like you told no, me. No, keep yeah. I'm the dumb one because you're talking. I'm sitting there just staring at it going, I know. Yeah, this is great, yeah. man. <laughs> and my eyes start to literally feel like they're going to cross. Um, yeah. OK, so you mentioned Mark Scaff and again, retiring there at UNC Wilmington. Was that the moment where infield play, and I'm sure we're going to get into catch play in a minute, but was that the moment that infield play became just a, a totally different animal for you? Because certainly that's where you've you know created your bread and butter there on the on the infield. Is that where it started? And then how did it transition to where catch play became an extremely important element of practice for you? That's a fantastic question, really. Um, see, I'm a student of the game. In order for me to succeed, Mm -hmm. I had to pay great attention to detail. I needed every advantage possible. Mm -hmm. You know, to be able to step on a field with guys like Tony Graffinino, I had Mike Mordecai ahead of me, I had Chipper that was just drafted as a shortstop, you know, and others. This is pro ball experience. You know, I have to, at 5'10", 163 pounds, switch hitter, I got to be able to do everything sheets, you know what yeah. I mean, yeah. to be relevant and have a shot. And I was the same way in college. I was very little coming up and, and I just was, I wanted knowledge. I wanted information that could help me be the best that I could possibly be. Uh, and it was that hunger and being around a guy like Mark Scaff that provided that information. I mean, he was, he was just dumping, you know, pails of, of knowledge on me every day. And, and I, was, I took it all in. And of oh, course, wow. once I started to have some success, um, it grew. I wanted to know more. And then once I got out of, you know, once I got out of playing and became a coach, it, I became even more hungry. You know, people were mm -hmm. asking me to speak. So, of course, you want to know what you're talking about. Sure. But, but more so than that, I wanted to be able to give my players everything that I could possibly give them to give them the best opportunity to be successful because that's, you know, I didn't have that in high school. Now, mm -hmm. I'm not talking, you know, junk about my high school coach. He did the best he could. And I've had some good, really good youth coaches. Mm -hmm. But overall, you know, the, the knowledge that Mark Scaff he, was giving me was on a whole nother spectrum. And uh, so the natural transition there for me, Sheets, is, you know, defense is about throwing and catching. I mean, if we break it down, it's really about throwing and catching. If you mm -hmm. can't throw and catch, you can't play. Simple as that. And I mean, I would, you know, show up to my high school practices as a first year high school coach and, and the kids were playing fetch, you know, like literally the sound of a chain link fence, like makes me like cringe, cringe you know? yeah. it cringe. <laughs> and uh, like, I couldn't even walk, you know, back and forth behind the players for fear for my life. <laughs> and, uh, and I had some good players with tons of potential, but you know, it, it hit me, you know, we did a throwing routine in college. It was abbreviated mm -hmm. and I really tried to build on it over time because I knew if we're going to practice hitting and we're going to practice taking ground balls or, or whatever, bunt defenses, first and thirds, none of that stuff can be completely effective if you can't throw and catch. So instead of just oh. taking the guys down the line and saying, go get loose and get ready for practice, mm -hmm. let's turn the catch play into the most important 20 minutes of practice so that when we can throw and catch at a super high level, Mm -hmm. It's going to transfer into the game. And, and I bought into that a long time ago. Uh, I, I didn't invent it or anything. <laughs> I've just sold out on it. And, um, you know, I've created some videos over time to try to help others uh, understand the importance of catch play. And, you know, then when I had my son, Tabor, and he was a little guy coming up, it, you know, I really started even thinking more along the lines of what do I got to do? to teach this young player how to have confidence and sure. how to grow his game. Because instead of like high school guys, you get high school guys from middle school, we spend so much time breaking them down sheets like and mm -hmm. building them back up. Their mm -hmm. skill sets are poor, generally speaking. And uh, how about, let's see if we can't 
lay the foundations early so that when they're getting to high school, we can get to more advanced play, mm. you know, mental, uh, even physical advanced stuff. And uh, so when Tabor was coming through, of course, I was writing the winning baseball stuff, which was a, a graduated developmentally approach uh, to, to teaching baseball. So mm -hmm. it all kind of fed into itself. And um, I've taken, I've stolen things from other people. I do so regularly. There's so much good information out there. And thanks to you, in part, and the ABCA, you know, I mean, that's what we do, right? Yeah. We, we, you know, we hear it once or twice, we give credit for it, and then it becomes ours. I mean, <laughs> I love yeah. it. Yeah. I mean, that, that, you know, that's what Springer will tell you, right? Yes, 100%. Uh, absolutely. So I'm, I'm no different. You should be no different, or any coach out there should be no different. We have to find out what works for us. So catch play, to me, is the, like, cornerstone of defense. And uh, and hence, we, we are where we are with the most important 20 minutes of practice. Wow. Okay, so set the tone for us as we go into these videos and we get into sharing your computer screen. You're going to walk us through the details inside this catch play routine. Again, as you call it, the most important 20 minutes of practice. Set the stage for us. What can we expect? How does it look? Maybe give us the time frame of what it takes to really implement this and get players comfortable to kind of rotate on their own. Just set the whole platform for this entire video share conversation. All right. Great questions. Multifaceted questions there. Really when you're teaching catch play, mm -hmm. you know, if you're a youth coach or a middle school coach, even a high school coach, you, you know, you have limited time with your players. So the last thing you want to do is implement a complete throwing routine in the first practice. I mean, they're, they're, gonna, they're not going to pay attention. They're going to be bored. You're going to lose them. So you have to put it in in increments, you know, a couple drills at a time and then let it build on itself over mm -hmm. time. Um, you know, that's a key. Another key is what level player are you dealing with? So my routine is just really an example of things that you can do. You might like this drill and not like that drill or, hey, I can modify this a little bit here. Mm -hmm. I think that's important. Another thing is my throwing routine, the most important 20 minutes of practice that I've created sheets is really um, how would I say it? It's really targeted towards the general thrower. Okay. And not not position specific. So, you know, a middle infielder at the collegiate or even high school levels is going to have a little bit different arm action mm -hmm. than, say, a pitcher would. So, you know, when I'm teaching these drills, I'm really teaching it just throwing in general. But but when I actually get with infielders, I specifically let them know the difference. And some people mm -hmm. will critique me online. They'll say, you know, that's not the way an infielder throws or whatever. And I, and I say, I know. This is not really created specifically for infielders. Sure. It's just a general throwing routine. So I think that's important to understand. And there are a couple drills, like the very first one, you'll see um, the standing wrist flip that we don't use at the high school level. You know, I don't implement that drill mm -hmm. uh, simply because it's not appropriate. I, you know, that's for the young guys. And I'll explain why it's there, why I chose to put it in once we get into the videos. Mm -hmm. But um, and I've also added videos since we filmed this. So I literally filmed this most important 20 minutes of practice around my presentation for the ABCA when I spoke mm -hmm. on the big stage, um, because it's a facet of increasing your consistency and range. That was my topic for infield play when I spoke in Indianapolis, um, was increasing consistency and range. Well, of course, I already said it, throwing and catching. If you're a high level thrower and catcher, you increase consistency and range. So that video was created um, and then shrunk down to one minute because obviously I needed to cover many more topics <laughs> than just sure. that. So yeah, yeah. So that really sets the tone for for how this video um, impacts the different levels and why it was created. Well, for anyone watching this video, you do have access to that through www.abcavideos.org. If you are a member and you attended that convention, you get it for free. If not, if you're a member, you will have a discounted price. So if you're interested in that video, go check it out. But for right now, Trent, we've got you live. And so let's go right into your computer screen and let you walk us through it and teach us the details inside this catch play routine. You ready for that? Looking forward to it. Let's attack. Screen up and ready to roll. Trent, take us through, again, the most important 20 minutes of practice. And we've got drill by drill by drill, and you're going to walk us through this and detail it. Man, go. The screen is yours. Absolutely. Well, stand and wrist flips, I mentioned earlier, we don't use this at the higher levels. The young guys, 
the youth players, you know, they they don't know how to stay on top and behind the baseball. They cut it, they push it. So that this is something that they can work on, um, you know, as they are learning to throw, just getting a feel for staying behind the baseball, mm-hmm. elbow up, you know, on top and behind, just getting good 12 to 6 rotation, maybe a little over-exaggeration on our actual release. But uh, nonetheless, it, it, it has its place in the younger parts of the game, mm-hmm. okay? Um, so we would really start with drill two, which is coming up. And as I talk about throwing here in a minute, I want to talk about catching. So I want to talk for a second about, you know, this guy right here, yeah. Will. Um, as he's receiving the baseball, he is beating the ball to the spot, and he is trying to make a clean catch. So if you had volume on right here, you would hear the pop of the glove. Because catch play, yes, it, it, it means catching the ball as well mm-hmm. as throwing. So, you know, right here, um, a lot of people ask, you know, why the figure eight? Rhythm and tempo. So some of the teaching cues that I have is we don't want to be robotic. Everything is athletic when you throw. And what we're exaggerating here is just good rhythm, good tempo, body turn, good extension, good glove side, mm-hmm. chin to the target. So you'll see them have a good finish. You know, the flaws that you typically see with this, the uh, kneeling figure eight is the guys staying too tall with their upper body. Mm. So moving to, to the third drill, which, by the way, she sees are about 30 seconds apiece. Okay. So young players have a hard time with a power position. I think when they can learn to create a decent power position and it's not, um, you know, like. You don't want to force the ball behind you too much. It's going to be more like 10 o'clock uh, for a right-hander if, if straight up and down is 12 o'clock. Mm-hmm. And they're just working on, you know, getting a little feel. I usually try to create a little rhythm. That's something we've added into this drill where you have a little rhythm on the backside, a little load, and then transfer that over to the front side. So now we just transition. Every 30 seconds, we're transitioning drills. So mm-hmm. we're, we're going to a stand and figure eight which is gonna isolate the upper body. The big thing to me with throwers is they don't get their body turned to the side enough. They, their chest stays open to their target, which is a major flaw. You mm-hmm. wanna get that turn right there and create that good direction. Um, and this really allows you to really force that extension out front. Okay, so basically what we're trying to get people to do by creating different feet positions is we're creating uncomfortable positions because you don't always throw from the same position with your feet. Mm -hmm. So you have to learn how to create good direction and good extension, you know, and a good finish. And that's what happens with stand and figure eight. Notice how Tabor right here, you know, he releases this back heel, Mm -hmm. which allows his hip to finish. So they have good glove side, wheels catching inside his shoulders. A lot of good things taking place right here within this very simple drill stand and figure eight um pitchers so when the pitchers are doing these drills you know what what i would be telling them sheets is four seam two seam change four seam two seam change Mm -hmm. we want to be alternating grips you want to get a feel for your grips you know where you're not changing a single thing so here with the uh, standing power position basically what you're creating is a post stride position so you'll notice The front foot is already open. He's already taken his stride. Mm -hmm. So they're not going to actually step forward. You're just loading on the backside. They're emphasizing a good power position. Even looking back at their hands sometimes. Tabor's done it so much he doesn't. But Will, you'll see him kind of look back. And that just tells the brain that I'm in the right place. Mm -hmm. Um, And you can see the really good extension. Both of them do a great job catching the ball. So you can see right here, this is called dominating the baseball where we're not stabbing at it, but we are catching the ball firmly and in the pocket of the glove. And these are things that I cover, of course, before we ever implement. But love the glove side here with Tabor and his head staying on the target. Trent, do you feel like by isolating, you know, really putting the feet in concrete and just really working the upper half, it's easier for you as a coach to walk by and not only give direction and correction, but for the player to truly feel exactly what you're talking about, because really the feet are out of it. There's no movement other than what's going on with the upper half. Do you find that? Absolutely, without a doubt. I mean, you know, any drill is a progression. And sometimes you have to kill the lower half um, so that the upper body can become the focus. And, the you know, because you can't give people too many things at one time. 
-hmm. So, you know, when I'm walking by, I can really, and I walk behind these guys as they're doing these drills and, um, you know, I can give them cues and constantly, uh, you know, remind them of what's important. Yeah. And that reminds me of the coaches have to be out here with these guys. Cause if we're in the dugout right now and I'm expecting my players to be doing this, there's no way. Okay. Mm -hmm. They're going to be talking about Fortnite. They're going to be, you know, don't mean to date the video, you know, but, uh, you know, <laughs> sure. uh, they're going to be talking about whatever. So, um, absolutely without a doubt. So mm -hmm. we should be moving here again, 30 seconds per drill. Um, stand in power position. So now this is a drill tempo arm swings that I learned from the big league pitching coach of the Oakland A's don't mean a name drop, but he's one of my very good friends, Scott Emerson. Yeah. And he was talking to me one day about pitching and he showed this drill. And I said, well, we got to add that into our, you know, our routine. So basically what they're doing is they're creating rhythm. Um, as the elbows go back or the throwing elbow goes back, you're going to see them load to their backside. So as the hand, as the ball goes back, they load back with the hips. You'll see with Tabor here, as his hand goes back, he loads, loads, and then gets back, transfer that energy, get back over that front side and follow. So with the infielders, what I'd be telling them here is we're going to be using more of a bow action where we're basically just starting in the center of our chest mm -hmm. and drawing straight back, almost like you're pulling a bow. Mm -hmm. um, but here again, they're just doing a general throwing routine. So good rhythm, good tempo, dominate the catch. These are two um, Division One players right now, so these guys have a pretty good feel for throwing. You can see they're, they're very accurate um, right. in their throwing. So, all right, boxers, drill seven. And what I would tell a team right now as we're doing these, like, guys, we're, we're like two and a half minutes in, you know, three minutes in to practice right now, and, and look, we're getting better, mm. you know. What are other teams doing three minutes into their getting loose to go practice? We're sure. literally becoming better throwers. And some cues I would be talking about here before I talk specifically about this drill sheets is aim small, miss small. So, like, literally they're not throwing to the, the person. Mm -hmm. They're literally throwing, like, Will right here is throwing to Tabor's left shoulder, his right shoulder, to his chin, to his belly button. You know, he's really focusing in on being accurate. Yeah. So – you know, what happens when these guys do these drills, they, they just throw to the general person. Well, when you're 80 feet away, 70 feet away, that's fine. But when you're making throws from the six hole over here on the infield across <laughs> sure. and, and you're, you know, and you're not quite accurate, well, the guy's going to be safe at first base. So let's yeah. talk about the boxers. This is a really difficult drill for people to learn. I typically have them do the feet before they ever – implement and i'm gonna i'm gonna um pull back a little on this one okay. um so all right tempo here we go boxer so you'll see Tabor's going front to back front to back load against the back then get out over the front so as an infielder or a, a position player we want our upper body in sync with our lower body so mm -hmm. you know by having quicker feet our upper body has to be quicker to stay on time and that's so we're learning to load against our backside Transfer energy, the energy, and then our our upper body and our arms got to catch up with our feet. Okay, that's why I love jumping rope so much because this it has the same effect. The slower your feet, the slower your hands. The faster your feet, the faster your hands. So it's not up and down; it's front to back. You got to release those heels and really get down the line. So what I talk about with guys when they're throwing is they're inside of a hallway. It's three foot wide. It's made of bricks and it goes to the sky. And nothing inside their their body should ever hit that wall. So when they throw, they should stay right down the line, like wow. literally put their chin in, the, you know, and, and whether that's 100% true and how we actually throw or not, you know, just working with high school guys for so long, I have found that to really help their direction. Direction, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know, and, and so all of these drills, they're using, they're, they're transferring energy from their feet to their upper body. Um, they're, they're learning to load against their backside and then get back over their front side. And then they're creating really good direction and finish, which are all keys to being an accurate thrower. So with jump backs, basically what you have here, it's an exaggerated boxer. So I tell them like, you're going to load on the front side. You're going to like jump across a tiny little stream. You know, you land against that backside. Then you got to explode back over the front side. So you'll see Tabor bringing his foot up, load back, and then get out over the front and follow. There's mm. 
So your feet, your feet are huge. Like the energy that you create with your lower half. In fact, it's throwing and hitting our sister skills. Mm -hmm. The way we use our body to create energy and doing both skills is very similar. So Will is loaded right here against his backside and he's going to transfer energy out over his front side and get downhill and you should want to follow. So you throw and then you naturally just allow yourself to follow. If you're not feeling the urge to follow, I would challenge you that you're probably not engaging your lower half quite enough and you're relying mm. too much on your arm. So we're a drill eight jump backs. Um, you know, as you're doing these again, once it's been taught, you really get through them pretty quickly. So I know it, uh, it, it looks like a general throwing uh, drill right here, Trent, but man, I could see pitchers really getting into this one. Yeah. Oh, no doubt. And that, that's the beauty of it. Like our entire team is doing this together. Yeah. And, um, you know, it, it's amazing. Like I've worked youth team sheets and it's amazing how much better they get in a very short period of time. It's force them to you, be athletic. Oh Lord. Yes. And yeah. please don't let them be robotic. I mean, <laughs> stiff knees, you know, feet together. Yuck. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> sure. that's, Oh, you gotta be an athlete. Throwers are, are athletes be athletic. So one eighties and three sixties, um, something I added in about four or five years ago, we want to, you know, have confidence to throw to a blind target. And we also use a lot of pickoffs, uh, where we literally have to spin, um, like here, will, will is a pitcher. He's pitching at Mercer right now. Okay. So that's a spin move to second, you know, but basically for all, all players, they're just learning how to rotate their body yeah. and then get back online. Yeah. So you don't want to fall off when Tabor threw there. He doesn't want to fall off towards the infield. He want to fight that fight, that inertia, get back online and get mm -hmm. the chin to the glove and follow. So, you know, when you're an infielder or an outfielder, oop, so Tabor, I would, the verbal cue I would have told him there is you started to follow before you finished your throw. Yeah. So finish your throw and just allow the backside to, to come along for the ride. Um, so they'll transition very quickly here to 360s, um, which is really difficult, actually. Right here, right, left, right, left. So it's a right, left spin, right, left throw. So you'll see he'll go right, left, right, left. You'll Tabor here will be more evident. So he's figuring it out. Here we go. Yeah. Right, left, spin, right, left, throw. Get down the line. And when when you learn to use your body athletically like this, um, it's amazing when you get in a game. So like an infielder, a shortstop goes up the yes. middle in the four hole here and basically has to, you know, the, the inertia takes him away. Mm -hmm. He has to spin just like he's doing right here pick up his target, boom, and throw to first. So everything that we're doing, we feel like makes them more athletic and more confident and really trust their ability to throw, you know? <laughs> um, so that's, that's the three sixties. So, um, can't emphasize enough. I mean, as we're talking through this, we're, we're, it's taking more time than it does in real life. Yeah. So here, we're going to throw on the run. So these are right-handed infielders are going to be, you know, um, Field off left, throw off right, you know, which is basically a slow roller type throw. Their posture is going to, you know, they're basically just going to bend at the waist to create lower posture. I'll try to pause here so you can see this. So field off left, throw off right. Yeah. So they're, they're creating a little bit of athleticism where now he's got to throw the ball back across his body, have a good glove side, bring elbows together. Um, and, and they're working together on this. These throws have to be made all the time, um, and they get much more confident when they do them every day. We've actually added in a drill to this, which I picked up from maybe Kai or Trotsky, two guys that I really, really like mm -hmm. amongst a couple others that I really, really like, um, where we just basically balance on our right leg and do the same action. It's a one-legged throw, I call it. It's actually in our routine, but it's not in this routine now. I've added it since. See, there's a perfect example of coaching and constantly refining what you do. So if I find something at the ABCA mm -hmm. or online that I want to add in, you know, it's just a constant refinement of what's going to help my players. So specialty throwing by position is a really neat segment we, we do for two minutes. Uh, basically, the infielders are going to be creating a perfect fielding position, over-exaggerating, out front, down low, early, 
you know, using the legs to get into a position. You'll see Tabor do the most efficient throw, which is just from his fielding position, he's going to come down right here, and he's going to get his feet under, underneath him and throw and follow. Yep. Will's going to be a relay, um, and then they just take turns. So Tabor will work on his relay into a power. Um, they do it a couple times each. And then Tabor will implement a double shuffle, which, you know, is something that infielders use a lot mm -hmm. for, for tempo and timing mm -hmm. and when they know they have time. So I don't know if it's this one that he'll do it. Um, he might have one more. Just So that's a, just a right-left field freeze. They're just exaggerating in the freeze and then a right-left throw, which is very efficient. You know, you have to, that, to me, that's the foundational movement to fielding. There's a double shuffle right there. Yeah. So they're adding in, you know, the little tempo movement. If you don't have a good grip or you have time, we'll actually add it in three. Tabor will go back to two. So so let me say, you know, the pitchers are working on flat grounds right here, maybe spinning mm -hmm. some breaking balls. Outfielders are working on fly ball footwork, ground ball footwork. Catchers are working throwing to second, throwing to third. So it's, it is what it, exactly it says, specialty throwing by position. Right. So, you know, infielders can add in. They can add in backhand, you know, set your feet, throw. Um, they literally, anything that they're struggling with when they take ground balls, they can implement here. But if you don't go game speed here and you don't over-exaggerate, in my opinion, really good mechanics, then yeah. you, can, you can actually cause problems. You can get yourself into, into bad movements. So, wow. That was going to be my follow-up, Trent, just how creative they can get within this. So, again, relative to the – the infielder, the outfielder, the catcher, they can turn this into anything they want. They can get super creative in that space. Absolutely. And if you have throwdown bases, I mean, they can work on double play pivots here. Mm -hmm. You know, you drop down each guy's an infielder, middle infielder here. He Will has a base, Tabor has a base. They can work on, you know, coming across the bag, you know, left foot on, left foot off. They can, you literally, it's limitless what you can do. But oh. I would encourage you get the foundational movements before you start to get creative. You know what I mean? Like mm, yeah. simple to complex, simple to complex, the, the basic teaching principle of, um, of anything that you're teaching. That is a fantastic first segment inside this video, Trent, that I think gives our viewers here watching this the opportunity to see that there are some creative things they can do inside this catch play routine. And I love the point that you kept coming back to, which if we want to promote athleticism within our guys, let's do some things right from the very onset of practice that's going to force them to get uncomfortable, find new ways to move their body, but more importantly, still pay close attention to playing great catch. Now, is there any other coaching points inside the first part that you really want to hammer down before we move on? Really more of the, the catching part of it, you know, okay. like moving your feet whenever possible, trying to catch the ball inside your shoulders. Um, the more advanced guys can start to use a little deflect action when they're mm -hmm. receiving, yep. you know, not just lazily receiving the ball. We, you know, we, the catchers, especially the catchers, like beating the ball to the spot, catching the ball under control, uh, what they have to do when they're receiving, you know, so you can turn any baseball skill into the mundane, or you can mm -hmm. like really try to get something out of it. So as a, th as a thrower, if you're aiming small, miss small, and then as a, as a receiver, if you're working on moving your feet, catching the ball inside your shoulders as much as possible, deflecting whenever possible, you know, I, I think that's going to transfer into to good actions in the game. Now, I'll just go ahead and make it clear. Anytime we're reaching outside our shoulders, we're mm -hmm. going one-handed, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Or up high or down low. So, but I'm talking about right inside, thumbs tied together, right inside your shoulders. So whenever we can get ourselves, fielding is about feet. Not just the, the, the field and throw, but the receiving. It's all about feet and hands. So you have to, as a coach, emphasize both both ends of the catch play. That is so good. Well, I know there's a back half to this, but also, again, we continue to compound ourselves over this creativity aspect. But now right. we're going to start lengthening out. We're going to get into some long toss, but still mm -hmm. focusing on the drill aspect of this. Absolutely. Let's get back in the videos. All right, great stuff. So here we are. Sheets were uh, – so we're moving into to, you know, long toss. Let's talk a little bit about long toss because, you know, you hear all sorts of different ideas, and, and I'm not saying that, that mine is necessarily right. I will say that we've had very few arm injuries. I think that has something to do with how we stretch. We, you know, we use the Jaeger bands, so 
give him a little promo because they're good. Good. It's a good. It's a good routine. Um, but anyways, we. Um, you know, I don't make the guys like back up on a regimented number of throws a certain amount of distance. They are basically dictating themselves how fast they go back, how many throws they want to make, and how long, how the distance that they're actually going to throw. Mm -hmm. So I really encourage them to, to manage their arm. I talk to them about the importance of that. And um, so basically, you know, long toss, here they're, they're already backed up. You didn't even see the progression. And they're out of season, so they're not going to go quite as far as they normally would. These two guys here, you know, can throw the ball from the foul line over the fence, you know, the fence in left field. Sure. You know, that these are, you know, that's what you're going to expect from D1 guys, right? So especially Will out there who's a Division One pitcher who's low 90s. But, uh, you know, so what they're doing is they're using their legs. Um, what you tend to see when guys start throwing long is a breakdown in mechanics. Okay, the, the, the arm starts getting disconnected, the glove starts getting disconnected, which means getting away from the body, they start getting over-rotational, um, they don't use their legs enough, and they don't allow themselves to finish. So to me, arm injuries, a lot of the arm injuries uh, happen from the deacceleration phase and not, a lot, not using the whole body to throw. Mm. So, you know, you can learn a lot. The ball speaks to you. I tell my guys all the time, so if you're throwing long and the ball is cutting and moving 10 feet, you know, um, to one side or the other or, you know, about killing the person next to you, um, then you have a problem. You know, you should be able to create a good line and consistently throw. And you should be able to develop a touch over time where you can literally throw, you know, to a great distance without bouncing the ball. And they're getting air up underneath it. And that then you have to take into account the wind and all these things. So you really have a feel for distance. Now, I do tell the guys, so if Tabor here, if his arm was bothering him, not bothering him, but maybe he just pitched a couple days before and Will's like, his arm's really live, I would tell Tabor, you know, work on throwing Will long hops. Yeah. You know, see if you can throw him a long hop. Or if you have to, if he's still going out there, go ahead and throw it out there and – um let it roll to him, you know, whatever. But don't feel like both guys have to consistently throw the ball in the air. And then they're going to determine how many they want to be out, how far they want to be out. So they're going to make five throws at maximum distance, and then they start to work their way back in. And we get to a point here where they're on top um, at 90. Mm -hmm. So this is a common phase you'll see a lot of, of throwing programs do now that I completely agree with. Um, this is really learning to find that release point again uh, that infielders would have throwing 90 plus feet. And, you know, they're going to go ahead and let it go a little bit. Again, this is off season for them. We were filming this in, I think, early December. And neither guy, they were kind of resting their arms from the, the, the college season in the fall. So, yeah. but they're, they're um, going to let it go a little bit. And, and when my guys, like right now, my high school guys were you know, we're getting ready for summer. They just played a whole high school season. I mean, they, when they let it go right here, they are like trying to knock this guy over. <laughs> um, I mean, they are staying on top and, yeah. and, and get a little giddy up, you know, yeah. a little giddy up to it. So, um, you know, that's what they're working on right here. And it, it really helps find that release point because last thing you want to do as an infielder is throw the ball, you know, 180 to 260 to 300 feet and then come in and take <laughs> start taking ground balls, you'll be chucking the ball over the dugout. <laughs> sure. um, so, yeah, they, they're just finding that release point there. That was really nice. Yeah. Nice line right there. And you see how they're still dominating their catch. You know, the, to me, that's a sign of an athlete. I tell my mm -hmm. players all the time, you know, a, a college coach, a pro scout can come and watch you play catch, and they can tell right away whether you got a shot or not, like mm -hmm. how athletic you are, your actions. I mean, look at the line of that ball right here. You know, they're just look at the control on the catch. So, yes. you know, it, it, his head's behind the ball, total control. It's really it's they make it look easy. But, you know, we didn't have to do retakes. I don't know, honestly, that they threw a ball away the entire time. And I was talking while they were doing this. So this probably took 30 minutes. They were repping out with no retakes. I don't think they threw one ball away. They might have wow. thrown a couple knee high and one just a little high. But that tells you the the confidence and consistency they have. Sure. So so now this is a you know to me this is huge. Um, 
quick feet, quick release. We compete, as you see here, three sets of 20 seconds. It's 45 feet, so halfway between first and second base, and they're going to make as many transitions as possible. So what are the keys? The keys are getting your feet moving before the catch, yep. deflecting the ball so you're not catching the ball, going in, taking it out, which takes a lot of time. Um, another is trying to throw the ball slightly to your partner's throwing side because he's throwing the ball back to you. If Will was throwing to somebody else out here, Tabor would be trying to throw to his glove side. So, um, And then throwing the ball from any angle that you catch. So they're quickly making transitions, how many transitions they can make in 20 seconds. At 45 feet, the record is 22 that I've seen with my own eyes. Wow. Yeah, that's that's getting after it. Yeah. So, you know, that not only are they being efficient, but they got a little giddy up without having to wind up, you know, and that's what young players start to learn, that being quick and under control is way more efficient than trying to load up and throw the ball as hard as you can. So when you get in a hurry, sheets, you make mistakes. Yes. So we want to be quick as opposed to being in a hurry. So w what I've also learned from this one is we do that one that we just did, and then we'll execute the same exact drill, but they plant their feet squared to each other so they're chest to chest yes you know and and they have to make as many transitions where their feet aren't tied in and that really helps them just focus on their upper body so well the, the challenge has been set so if anybody watching this you got to put yep. the you must put the stopwatch on the screen but let's see if we can beat 22 there's a challenge has been thrown out there by coach Mongero. amen 45 <laughs> feet so it's halfway between first and second that can be either foul line yeah it can be third to second or first to second halfway 45 feet, and then, uh, yes, 20 seconds. Wow. And the catch, the, 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 the catch has to be made before the, you know, the clock, the whistle goes off. Yeah. So it's not – you can't catch, count that last catch if the ball's in the air when the whistle goes off. <laughs> Love it. So, yep. So here, you know, we add in – and literally with my young guys right now, my rising ninth graders, we have been doing this week. We've been implementing some of our pickoff moves. So – it's just they're kind of addendums to the, the throwing routine. So if we don't have time to go out and work team picks in a carousel setting, you know, or a team D setting, mm -hmm. if, if we have our entire team working picks and you might say, why your entire team? Well, it, 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 it teaches athleticism, it teaches body control, and it gives those outfielders a little appreciation mm -hmm. for what these uh, pitchers are trying to do. So they're going to do um, inside moves. Where basically okay. they're touching right behind the rubber, um, they're selling their delivery to the plate, so everything's exactly the same as they would when they go to the dish. So you'll see Tabor here, you know, basically just work a perfect inside move. They're going to touch behind, right behind the rubber, so it's not a balk. But if the guy is stealing third, they'll be able to reset their feet. If they have them picked off, you'll see that he basically just oh he's picked, so he makes the throw. Mm -hmm. And we're teaching belt high. You don't want to try to be perfect on the knees. Most pitchers um so that will was using a different pick there mm -hmm. um so basically he was doing a third to first which is still legal in high school uh, at least at least now it is we'll see <laughs> for <about> now <laughs> yeah sure. um rundowns we're going to execute our rundown execution uh basically cutting down the distance getting the ball out will we release i don't have time to go through all the rules of the rundown i do have those on my youtube channel if somebody wants to check that out but you'll see them We'll do this with the, the entire team. So we'll have throw down base here, oh, throw wow. down base is second, and we'll have at least three lines of guys doing the same thing. And I'll sometimes let my outfielders get in this as well. It's always good that they get an appreciation for what the infielders have to do. Mm -hmm. um, it just, it just, you know, I think that's anything in life. When you learn what other people do, you, you, you know, you take pride in it and you understand yeah. there's a, an element of difficulty to everything that's going on in the field. So, in the video here, if you were to watch this on my YouTube channel, I'm actually giving cues um, in the video. That's why they're standing here not doing anything. They're, I'm teaching the rules, but they're about to start. Um, and the big thing to me is getting the guy moving under control and the guy that's receiving, cutting down the distance, and then once he recognizes the good feed, he still continues through the ball. Hmm. So I think they did one rep, yeah, just to show it. And that yep. was like not game speed. So we would be, you know, um, doing that game speed. Um, so then they move on to the next phase here, which is glove flip, which, you know, I, I used to be a 
like totally against glove flips, you know, but uh, <laughs> like it was a showboat thing. But there you is fun, a fun hater. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm all about fun now. But, mm-hmm. but, 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 it, you know, we're not going to do it to showboat when yeah. we can, you know, get our, with our throwing hand in and make a good feed. Mm-hmm. But there are times, and I've seen it happen a, a few times with my own teams. And of course, you see it all the time now in college professionally where you, where you don't have time and you have to learn to glove flip. Mm-hmm. Glove flip. There's a, there's a skill to it, certainly. Um, so they're going to compete just like we did quick feet, quick release, how many transitions they can make. And I think they're like 20 you know, feet apart or so. Uh, 25 feet. I don't. I don't really have a measurement for that. Just something within the range of where you would normally make a glove flip, you know. So, and they're going to make as many as they can in 20 seconds. Um, they should be ready to go here. Looks like they're gearing up, um, moving the feet, using the legs, and just trying to make an accurate feed with the glove, backhand and forehand. So there's a. There yeah. it is. Yeah. And you you find your guys, I mean, once they can establish this and they can play really good catch back and forth with only their glove, don't you feel like they develop a little bit of what we used to call it in coaching, glove confidence? They feel like they can do anything with that glove as they're demonstrating right here? Absolutely. It should, yes, without a doubt. And it should be an extension of your body. You yes. know what I mean? Like, to me, you know, in sports, the tennis racket is an extension of, of the hand, you know. The lacrosse stick is an extension of the hand. The glove is an extension of the hand. So, you know, if you're an athletic player, you know, your, your glove is a tool that you have to be able to use. So, right. you know, there's no doubt. And then the last one that these are just double play feeds that they're working on. They could have done this in the specialty throwing by position segment, but they're just working on footwork and some of their feeds. Um, and we haven't used this one much lately. Um And the glove flip, I need to actually start implementing a little bit more than we have lately. Um, You know, the the drills that you saw coming all the way into quick feet and quick release are used. We literally do that every day. It Mm -hmm. wasn't like something that I created to try to, like, impress people. And, um, you know, so we we don't necessarily – I'll let it play while we're talking, but – You'll just see them working on a couple different feeds here for each other. Will was a middle infielder in high school, shortstop pitcher, and Tabor's a middle infielder in college. So, you know, they're just working on their footwork and their and their feeds. So mm-hmm. that's all they're doing here and, and then done. I mean, literally, you know, the video is 13 minutes long, and I'm teaching in it. So, you know, the throwing long, however, wow. you know, backing up, coming back in, that's going to take up a little bit more time. And I don't think that I showed the full two minutes of – of um, specialty throwing by position. So they're just lo- throwing from different angles. You know, you want to field from, excuse me, you want to feed from where you field. So yep. that's all they're doing, working on some different actions here um, to finish it up. So, yeah, that wow. that's pretty much it. Sheets, yep. Well, Trent, I'll speak for the community that's watching this. We all got better having you detail through that entire catch play routine. And, again, I can't emphasize it enough, promoting athleticism, creativity, and certainly I, I would like to speak for on behalf of your team here. They're sweating. If that's the first 20 minutes, they've got a good <laughs> lather and they're ready to move into the next phase and practice. But uh, is there any other advice that you have to offer? So someone paying attention to this and listening, send them down a better path. What advice would you offer, Trent? Well, the thing that comes to mind really, Sheets, is the young players that are learning how to throw and catch. And something I want to caution, you know, you can do a lot of these drills with kids a lot younger than you might imagine. Mm -hmm. Like eight-year-olds, they can get this. You know, seven-year-olds can get some of it. They really can. They really can. Like the basic stuff. And then once they have that, you can like add in little by little by little. Definitely want to chunk it, chunk the information. But The biggest thing that I see that I want to caution parents about is really young kids, four, five, six, seven-year-olds, okay, going all the way down to the Mm -hmm. beginning foundations of the game. So what do we do when we're, 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 you know, sending out our young boys and girls to play? We buy these tiny little gloves that the ball barely fits in, right? Like their hand-eye is not good. You know, think about as an adult, if we literally wore a a glove like that was just the size of our hand and, you know, we're players, you know, like that would be difficult. That's what we do with training gloves, you know, but uh, in the game, we have a little margin for error. And and what I my logic said, and I shared this in my winning baseball books, you know, 10, 11, 12 years ago, 
what I did with my own son is I got a, an adult infielder's glove that was already broken in, yep. a smaller one, and I tightened the back here. You know, the mm-hmm. I tightened the back of the glove, and and basically when the ball went in that glove, it it almost closed itself. So what's right. the goal? What are we trying to do? We're trying to teach confidence, right? So you know, confidence is success to me, and uh, so then really having a progression. So kids are afraid of the ball, right? So you don't want to use real baseballs. Uh, you want to use tennis balls or incredible balls or something a little bit, you know, softer. So if it mm-hmm. does hit them, but like I literally controlled the environment so much when Tabor was first learning how to catch when he was two, three, four years old, I would have him hold his glove out to his side because they're, you know, if you look here, I, I'm, I'm, there's no fear in getting hit. Right. Sure. So once I learned to control that, then I got, I, I implemented a little movement to the glove side. So I want you to go from this cone to this cone, Tabor. You don't have to go real fast. And yeah. I'm just going to lead you with an underhand toss. And I want you to learn, get the confidence to catch the ball on a little jog, you know. And once he could do that, you know, then I started going to the backhand. I'd have him preset over across his body to the backhand. So, again, he wasn't worried about getting hit, mm-hmm. you know. And then catch. And whenever I get the ball in his glove, it would stick. And then movement to the backhand. And then, then you start getting a little random. All of a sudden, you make a bad throw, and whew, you know they, yeah. they act like it's no big deal. And, and I had found by just doing a natural progression in catch play, and, and, and I'm not special, my son's not special, just using us as examples that I think you can take anybody that has some hand-eye, mm-hmm. and you can put them in a system like this, Sheets, and literally like by the time they're seven, eight years old, they're playing adult level catch. You know what I mean? They're doing the throwing drills. They're catching the ball. I mean, I remember playing catch Tabor when he was seven years old, and people were like, thought I was nuts because I can play like full level catch with a real baseball. And again, it was just because I just basically took logic and said, let's get a glove that he can use, mm-hmm. and then let's build these skill sets up, and then let's progress to the point where where he has the confidence. And once the confidence is there and they know they can do it, you're all set. And now when you go out and, and you're playing coach machine pitch, running around in the field and the ball's hit up in the air, they're catching the ball, right? Right. And they're throwing the ball. And um, and then, you know, you can do that with your team. You can do that with your kid. And um, so that's what, to me, that's what coaching is. It's just breaking skills down, understanding where somebody's at, mm-hmm. building their confidence, and then you put the whole skill back together. And um, so, yeah, so the college guy, we don't need to worry about that with him. The advanced sure. high school guy, obviously. But, you know, who's going to be watching this video? There's, you know, the, you never know what age that person might be dealing with. Yeah. And uh, so we always tend to go right to the highest level. So there's something for the beginner. <laughs> Make a note right here to throw Cooper's glove away that I got uh, when I get home and <laughs> suit him for a bigger too? glove. <laughs> no, I, I got him a okay. really nice glove, but it is okay. a smaller glove. But it makes, it makes all the, the sense in the world, again, if we're trying to – transitioning them out of not being afraid of the baseball, having a lot of success and making the catch. All yep. those things are huge. Uh, yep. Trent, this has been a phenomenal opportunity, but before we go, I want to give you the opportunity for any coach paying attention to this. I know how open you are. Our relationship goes way back and you're one of my dear friends, but for anyone that's watched this, it's like, you know what? I've got more questions. I'd like to connect with Trent, see what else he has to offer. Uh, how can they connect with you? Well, through Twitter, uh, coach Mongero, um, and really, we've started Dirt Brothers Baseball, dirtbrosbaseball.com. Uh, they can reach me through that. Um, and, you know, basically all the stuff that we talk about, um, I've put out there on my YouTube channel. So Coach Mongero, you know, could pull up YouTube, Coach Mongero. My channel should come right up. There's over 100 clips uh, that people can check out. And, you know, like it, don't like it, leave a comment, whatever. <laughs> it's all about getting you thinking, right? Yeah. So uh, that's what I do. And, and uh Hopefully it'll help somebody. But I appreciate you having me on, Sheets, man. Always a pleasure. Yes, and it's always a pleasure for us to be able to highlight just some special people that are out there inside our association that have a caring and a sharing spirit. And, Trent, you certainly encompass that, man. So, again, thanks for taking some time, letting us dive into your computer. Uh, But, man, we wish you all the best of luck in the world at Glenn, and I look forward to catching up with you again soon, my man. Awesome, Sheets. And uh, congrats on that that baby, man. It's awesome. Keep sending those videos. Yep. Will do. (laughs) 